Alistair Spalding, I'm the artistic director here at Sadler's Wells. Um, and thanks for coming to this insight evening uh, into Xenos. Um, so we have uh, more or less all of the collaborative uh, team uh, for this production here. Um, so we have uh, Maven Koo, uh, who is the rehearsal director. That's his title on the page, but I know he's much more than that in the creative process. Uh, we have Michael Hulls, the genius lighting designer. Um, we have this chap, Akram <laughs> Khan, who's something uh, to do with it. Ruth Little, uh, who is the dramaturg, and again, much more than that word uh, implies. And uh, Vincento Lamagna, who made this fantastic uh, musical score for the evening. Um, but we're also joined uh, tonight, this afternoon, by Royona Mitra. Uh, she's an academic, um, and um, but she's written um, one of the only uh, books about Akram Khan, uh, Akram Khan, Dancing New Interculturalism. Um, and uh, it's available on Amazon and all good bookshops. <laughs> <laughs> so please go out and buy it. Um, and Ruana is, uh, has, is going to, has um, written some uh, provocations um, to uh, help us to have this discussion. So she's written three pieces um, which we're going to um, hear. Um, and after each piece, um, we're going to have a discussion uh, on the panel um, about the issues that she's raised uh, in those provocations. Um, we're going to start off with the first uh, provocation on the politics of writing histories. Uh, and before Royana is uh, going to speak, we're going to have a short video. And then I was a father, I was a son, and then in another time, in another time I was a daughter, and then a father again, and a mother several times, in another time. In my life I was a lover, again, several times, and for long stretches, Alone. I've been alone. I am alone. I've been a soldier. A nurse. I am alone. And again, I've killed. And been killed. And again, I've killed. I am alone. history? Which version? Who writes it? And who gets written out? Can the story of the Great War be retold by those whose voices were silenced? Zenos pulls no punches to expose what the British Ghanaian writer and journalist Efwa Hirsch has recently referred to as a state-sponsored amnesia with regards to Britain's relationship with its colonial past. It calls out the violent erasure of approximately 1.4 million Indian colonial soldiers from the dominant narratives of World War I by casting a stark light on these uncommemorated subjects. And as the beam slowly moves across the audience and blinds us out of our apathetic states, we are all implicated in these erasures. Zenos critiques predominant histories of World War I as incomplete, one-dimensional, whitewashed even. It then rewrites these histories by generating complementary narratives that run parallel, intersecting, undercutting, and nuancing the dominant versions. It, it makes history murky 
by centralizing the Indian soldier, the brown body, at the heart of these narratives, writing himself and his experiences into the very earth that he has been shoveled out of. Thank you. Um, so clearly this, uh, pro this particular provocation is <coughs> around uh, this light that's been shone on this situation uh, in this piece uh, about the part that uh, colonial soldiers made uh, well, uh, brought to the First World War and have been written out of history. And um, maybe starting with uh, Ruth Nakram, this, this notion <coughs> of working with the subject of the First World War um, through the Commission of 18, tw uh, 1418 now um, brought out that idea of, of bringing this story. Um, but how did, you, how did you come onto this subject? <laughs> Uh, through research initially and conversation, as we always do, and I think when the, in a sense, the 1418 now commission was a provocation to go into a story connected with the First World War from a new perspective uh, and an inevitable perspective, given that Akram's body, as as a solo dancer, was always intended to be at the centre of it. So. From the very beginning, I think we were working with the idea of the othered body that's inevitable. And, and, so, and because Akram's own background is, is Bangladeshi, we, we started to look into the archives related to the experience of colonial soldiers, particularly uh, colonial soldiers from India uh, in the First World War. And the first thing that we discovered, this is even just two years ago, was that those archives were, were more deeply buried than our own white archives of, uh, of the contribution of soldiers in the First World War. And when using uh, materials at the Imperial War Museum and that very brilliant BBC radio documentary about the ghostly voices of the First World War, we really, ironically, our way, I think, into this project was through voice and was through the voices that had been silenced. And we wanted to find a way to give expression to that absence. Uh, and then the more you look, the more you find the traces and the words, like the opening language or the opening text of the piece, do not think that this is war, this is not war, it is the ending of the world. That was written in a letter from an Indian soldier, a wounded soldier in Brighton in 1915. So. That, I think, that really became the orientation from very early on. This is the ending of the world as it was for those soldiers and those bodies. And, and so was this um, something you felt very strongly about politically to, uh, was, it, was this an urge to also tell this story um, coming from a very personal uh, but, but political point of view? I think so. I mean, it, it, it's, um, it's something that Ruth and I have been exploring, uh, especially since my children were born, <clears throat> that I was interested in other people's stories. Mm. Um, Dish was a very personal mm. story, but yeah. um, Until the Lions is not... Uh, uh, it, it was... I, I think it was about... Uh, uh, again, this is... Uh, this Zenos, the piece is one perspective, um, but there are 360 perspective, and it's about getting a 360 perspective rather than from your own perspective, mm -hmm. from the other. And that, that seed was planted of um, listening to the other person's story um, uh, uh, was when Larbi and I first collaborated together. Mm -hmm. That was really the planting of the seed of collaboration, and, but listening to the other, mm -hmm. um, which Ruth had attended that and we spoke a lot about the idea of collaboration. So, but also the idea of Xenos uh, for me was very much that I was becoming a stranger to my own body with age. Mm -hmm. I didn't recognize the body, my body. Um, and, uh, but that's something that's also universal mm -hmm. with time, mm -hmm. with everyone. So you talk about the, the other, this, this, and you mean the soldier, you, the soldier's voice is the other there, this, this, um this other person you're having a dialogue with, in a way, from the past, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it, certainly the soldier and the idea of the soldier was at the center, but it, I think it quite quickly came to speak more widely of, of those who have been displaced in various ways. And uh, the first thing that you find when you read any accounts of the First World War is that it's 
it happens in the body. War happens in the body. I mean, the First World War, of course, was hugely industrialised, but it was individuals who, who sat in the trenches who were bored and uncomfortable and frightened and, and isolated uh, and who also discovered new kinds of alliance and kinship. But it's a, it was, and whose feet rotted, and it, you know, it was a bodily experience. And so that's why when I say we began with, with written texts and voices, it, it actually became quite a natural thing, I think, to take that experience of shell shock, which is perhaps the defining psychological experience of the First World War, and bring the logic of shell shock, the brokenness of it, into all aspects of the, of the piece, into the lighting, into the music, and into the movement. So the soldier's body becomes the shell-shocked body. I think yeah. that's visible and palpable within yeah, the work. Yeah. I mean, there are a few moments in the piece where there is uh, literally a shock, and mostly it's <laughs> provided by you, Vincenzo, and also uh, yeah. Michael, the, the lighting. This is, this is something that was woven in as, a, as part of the musical and, and visual landscape. Yeah, definitely. The more we were working on it, the more it was clear that uh, we wanted to create a sense of confusion almost, I guess, you know, when uh, the idea of these uh, men in the trenches uh, living a, a, a reality that is not his own one and not knowing where, where he is, like feeling completely out of place and, and disoriented. Yeah, that's, that's a great uh, way of putting it. So, yeah, the sound, a lot of the sound uh, was conceived with that in mind, with this energy of um, creating a world that it's, you can identify elements, but it's not clearly um, necessarily a, a battlefield. There is an element of that, but it, th there, are, there are other aspects to it. So uh, I don't know if the confusion is the right word, but there is an element of, uh, yeah, disorientation. Because one of the things that must have happened was that it wasn't just that they were thrown into war like all of the other soldiers, but they were taken from such a place mm -hmm. far away from their, any of their experiences and thrown into this, into this hell. Mm -hmm. um, so that was an added kind of uh, feeling of isolation and, and fear and confusion, as you say. I think one has to, uh, we felt that we have to identify where this person belongs before they go on the journey, yeah. otherwise we will never get a sense of his home yeah. or his... There is, a, there is a biography that the character that Akram <coughs> embodies has, has a history and has a story, but of course it's not, it's, not, it's not immediately perceived by us when we watch it, but that's precisely the point, because those men just became obliterated in every sense, yeah. and yeah. so to, to remember is in a way to put that body back together, and we had to we had to give a story to that body, and so there was a story about the Akram's character, the ex, the, the dead man marked on the map, if you like, having been a dance master, having been a skilled craftsman, uh, and all of that knowledge was literally dragged away from him yeah. by the war, in that, and as you see in that, op that opening moment, um, the transformation scene. I mean, uh, one of the things about 1418 now as a festival is that it has shone a light on, a lot, uh, on the real stories that were behind the First War. It's been very effective in that. But I suppose um, one of my questions is why, why, that, why that history was uh, hidden? You know, what was it that, that clouded, that put these stories at the bottom of the pile in terms of, well, you know, maybe you have some theories on this. <laughs> I'm no historian, I have to start off with that um, confession, but I think there is a history in covering up inconvenient truths. There's a history, uh, you know, from what I understand as I've read more and more into um, these untold stories is even as Britain w um, went into in having colonial soldiers join them, for the First World War, there was a sense that there were narratives around the way in which these colonial soldiers were still being treated and referred to as savages, as you know, the, the vocabulary around that, the kind of um, the kind of uh, fearful, hateful language that still went into describing these people who were working for the country, for the nation, for the war. 
there have been, I think Ruth and I were earlier talking about images of um, English nurses who were found treating Indian colonial soldiers who were, in, which were kind of censored out of the media. So it, it, it is a colonial, playing out of colonial um, psychology of, of the superior kind of the white supremacist position. And even as you were using the labor of those who were helping out the nation, yeah. in those very moments, you were still undermining those yeah. subjects who were helping out. I don't know if I can say why they were erased. I think it's, that's how you kind of deal with truths that are inconvenient. But they, I, they were doubly shafted, really, weren't they? Because when they went home, India was embarking on its, yeah. its movement towards uh, independence. Yeah. And, yeah, yes. Uh, and yeah. so the nationalism yes. that rose in response to the betrayals of the First World War, yes. i.e., you fight for us, we will allow you to yeah. move towards responsible self-government. Mm. Oh, no, we won't. Actually, we'll bring in even more onerous laws to yes. control your yes. behaviours and your bodies. So anyone who fought in that war had to be pushed aside because they were part of a, a, a national shame at that point. Yes, so yeah, they yeah. were just got lost completely. Yeah. It's the same as the Irish soldiers that came back. They yeah. fought in the First World War, then they came back and they were exactly. treated as enemies at home as exactly. well because of the nationalism yeah. that's going on there. So in a way, you were saying that actually it's something to do with the prejudice that was going on at that time, uh, which yeah. is still which was then carried on and. Uh, and so, so this is, this is, did you feel a strong passion to, once you, once you found out these stories, you really wanted to make this the centrepiece of this work? Yeah, because of history. Because there was this other beginning with Prometheus. It was originally... There still is, yeah. you just can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> it's absorbed into yeah. the body yeah. and the yeah. story. Yeah. yeah. But it was, yeah, originally I was fascinated by Greek mythology and my mother used to tell me a lot of stories about Greek mythology. Uh, used to tell me stories of Greek mythology, so Prometheus was the one I loved yeah. mostly, and I thought, oh, I'd like to, uh, we, we'd like to explore that, but uh, we just realised as we were going along that there's so many connections yeah. to uh, the eternal soldier. Mm. <laughs> uh, the it, soldier trapped in the wires is like Prometheus trapped you know, in, yes. in, in the mountains. But is it also something to do with the fact that you, you tend to um, tell universal stories going back to a, pers to a personal history. You start with a personal kind of um, position or, or, and then, then you widen it out to universal themes and you're, well, that's the kind of strand, isn't it? A little bit. I mean, Prometheus is more mythical. <clears throat> mm. So it's a, it's a space that lives very much in the past for me uh, or that's eternal. <clears throat> and I, I felt very strongly with the Indian soldier because it's like I, it was closer in history, time mm. to me. And so there was something about that and then the mythical and, and making from personal. So I connected with the Indian soldier and then the connection to mythical uh, character became, yeah, that relationship is very important, I think. So maybe, maybe I could ask you a question about, what, about dance as a, as a form and how it's good at telling these stories. Do you think it is good? Do you, I mean, I personally obviously <laughs> <laughs> I think it's brilliant, but, but is, there, is there a quality you can describe which, because it, it communicates so, so clearly and, and straightforwardly uh, about some of these uh, issues? Well, I think I can, I can um, elaborate specifically on Akram's work in yeah. relation to dance in that perspective, because I think what is fascinating is that um, uh, he, he's, with this work in particular, in order for him to find that space where the message became so universal and the experience so tangible for audiences, initially we, there was a deep um, kind of investigation of details. Mm -hmm. The work is highly detailed with layers and layers and layers. So it went from the clarity of a kind of biography of who this person was and then there's, a, there's the text of the Indian classical work that he first dances at the piece. Yeah. So we went quite heavily in a very classical mode of thinking in terms of how we would delve into that text <clears throat> from an Abhinaya perspective in Indian dance. Mm -hmm. And the more detailed it went, the more it allowed for suggest suggestions yeah. and possibilities of subtext. Yeah. So I think it's a very specific mode of process yeah. uh, within his dance making um, that is about 
delving into detailed depth in order for suggestion to be possible. Mm, mm. Um, and we were just saying just now, I think one, because I, I work quite a lot now with Akram and I have the wonderful responsibility of also staging his work often or coaching his work, I think what is very interesting is the whole um, element that the work essentially first and foremost is about an experience that has to be felt. And because it is so well crafted, it allows for a discourse to happen after. Yeah. But the initial premise is to touch. Yeah. And therefore it becomes very human and very emotional. I mean, uh, interesting with this work, even though it's about the Indian soldier, <clears throat> I think inevitably, particularly in Lacrimosa at the end, because of Akram's history itself and audiences that have followed him for years, the emotional, um, uh, uh, the, the, the emotion that one feels watching him dance that piece, and I think there's a section where he repeats a series of turns, yeah. which is from Rush, I believe. Yeah. I, when Ruth and I first saw it, we just started crying so much because the beautiful juxtaposition of the life of the soldier with the history of Akram's life yeah. in that repetition of movement is so palpable. Yeah. Um, and it comes from that mode <coughs> of process that he's mm -hmm. kind of developed so beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I suppose that, well, that's what I was getting at. I mean, you know, there's nothing more powerful than those moments towards the end there. And I can't think of another art form that really can do that so well yeah. and so, so viscerally. But I remember Maven, you, sorry, Michael, I remember Maven saying to me during one of the rehearsals in Akram, you had just been dancing that, that section and you were facing away from us and, and you sort of grabbed my hand and said, look at, look at his shoulders, he's so tired. And he, he's not trying to be virtuosic and yeah. and completely in control after this he he is allowing himself to be to be vulnerable to be yeah. fragile and that mm. that in itself in, we don't necessarily see it but i think we feel it yeah. because it's truthful Absolutely. it is mm. actually expressed in oh, the oh i movement. feel yeah. it yeah. i know you <laughs> <used> it. <laughs> yeah. sorry michael i was yeah. just going to say it's also the context of that because that movement comes out of uh, being a broken uh, the body being broken down, um, smashed, you know, mm. the way that you're moving before that. Mm. And then mm. you get that movement rebuilt, yeah. rebuilt out of that. Mm. That's, uh, so that's that transformation mm. in the body mm. that mm. is mm. very emotionally powerful. And I think that's what's so powerful about the parallel that's beautifully evoked in the piece between the, the mechanization and the kind of othering of the soldiered body and, and, the, and the military training that goes into you know, dehumanizing these bodies, and, then the, and how that's evoked in that opening classical section where we do see the body, the, this extreme masterful dancer broken and already traumatized and already fractured. And I think when I watched it for the second time, I've seen it twice this week, the first time I didn't have this, what I'm about to say, but the second time what I, what I felt was I already felt that you were drawing back them on the memory of being at war yeah. in that opening section. It was already broken. Yeah. 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 Can I ask um, a question to all the collaborators um, in that once this, uh, uh, basically how it works, um, once this subject is decided upon and, uh, uh, and that's the exploration, how, how does that work in terms of the communication and the involvement of the collaborators? At what stage... Uh, are you, are you introduced to these themes? And uh, Michael, I'll ask you first. Is, a, is it you come in day before the premiere and do the lighting? Or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly that. <laughs> About 10 minutes before, and we just go, yeah, yeah it is. Um, as, I mean, I can't say, I don't know exactly when the process you know, started. Um, so I don't know, I suspect it was quite near the beginning that I was aware of, uh, of these two themes, uh, the First World War, a, you know, Indian you know, colonial soldier, and uh, this interest in the Promethean myth. Um, yeah, I think it's quite, it's quite early. I mean, I don't know how long this idea has been like kind of slightly fermenting yeah. in Akram and Ruth's head, yeah. but um, uh, early enough, uh, to really get involved um, mm. with it, uh, and I, um, and that's not just that's not just the lighting, 
that's all the discussions about yeah, sure. the, the themes and the subject matter and um, everything that goes into creating um, a theatrical world yeah. that, that, that has sense and um, can say something and be um, emotionally um, engaging as well. Mm -hmm. but Michael and I are like a couple of old harpies at the beginning of that process because Akram always begins the process by just bringing everything together. And so we had a collaborators meeting and I remember you saying, you know, this is going to be a piece about Prometheus, we're going to tell the story of Prometheus, we're going to tell the story of the First World War and the <laughs> 1.4 million Indian soldiers who, whose voices were lost there. And we're going to tell a story about artificial intelligence because I really want to tell a story about artificial intelligence. And I remember and, Michael... And body hacking and yeah. future yeah. technology. I remember and Michael like... sending a little email at the end of that day sort of going, whoa, whoa, whoa. We, we can't do everything at once. So, and we didn't do everything at once. And the artificial intelligence just keeps on getting parked project by project. So <laughs> it will happen. Next There's one. no Next question one. about that at all. But it is interesting how you begin with the sort of whole realm of possibilities and... And gradually, things get, uh, I think they either get shed or absorbed. Those are the two things that happen to them. Uh, but nothing is lost. Absolutely mm -hmm. nothing is lost. But you have to go through this process where you've, there's a wall of impossible scale coming at you in terms of the subject matter. And you yeah. know that it won't end that way, but you still have to go through it to let, yeah. to let that refining happen, I think. Okay. So I think, it, yeah, quite quickly for me, um, it became apparent that the myth of Prometheus and uh, colonial soldiers in the First World War was kind of more than enough on its own. <laughs> and so there's a process of where you strip away, yeah. you get rid of uh, what's not really crucial, you know, to something. I mean, just... OK, so then the, the Promethean myth became less important, but having it there at the beginning makes you look for connections and uh, images arise out of yeah. how do these two things kind of relate? How can we make kind of sense and, and combine uh, these two ideas? Yeah. Yeah. I've been given the red light, so we have to move <laughs> on to the next uh, <laughs> topic. Um, and um, so uh, we are on to the present. Uh, so again, we're going to see a little uh, video first. Wouldn't it be convenient if we could just view Xenos only as commemoration of the Great War? If we could just box it up as history and just put it away in the attic along with the poppies we buy on Remembrance Sunday every year? If we could pretend how little it has to do with our current lives? Instead, Xenos is an inconvenient truth. It is an urgent call to recognize the devastating state of humanity, to recognize that the erasure of all minority subjects isn't just a thing of the past. Zenos speaks to me about so many contemporary realities worldwide right, right now. 
It reminds me that the lives and deaths of black, brown, queer, immigrant, trans, disabled people continue not to matter. That the threat of nuclear war is carried out on social media. That women's reproductive rights are policed to this day. That the Dalits in India are silenced. That the US and the UK are exercising hostile border and immigration regimes. That nations are increasingly isolationist, protectionist, and inward looking. That we are hurtling towards this thing called Brexit at the speed of light. I could go on and on and on. So, um, I suppose what you're saying is that <clears throat> although this uh, piece, the subject matter, started in one way, uh, it says so many other things about the world we're living in. I mean, we were talking a little bit earlier about when you um, premiered this work in Athens. Mm -hmm. Many people, I think, Vincenzo, you were saying, uh, many people were saying this is all about immigration. <laughs> uh, this is about how people are uh, always seen as the other and in uh, an unfriendly way. So do you want to just well, talk was, about... Well, I was speaking to someone from the audience and there was a beautiful comment, actually. Um, she said, I felt the loneliness that uh, the immigrants, mm -hmm. the refugees must feel mm -hmm. during the journey. Yeah. And that uh, made me... Um, smile in a, in a not not about what she was saying, but by the fact that we managed to um, make her feel something that wasn't directly what the story that we were saying. But I realized that the piece was more universal than than just the story of um, of, of the of the Indian Indian soldier, and perhaps because I guess the refugee crisis is very uh, is felt a lot in Greece as well as in Italy actually. Um, but yeah, I, there was this very powerful feedback about how the loneliness of Akram on stage um, resonated with her on that, on that side. Yeah. Did you expect that to happen, in this, that, that it would ha become more universal than that, than the one we, subject? I think we, we did actually, from the beginning, think of it through the lens of, of the refugee. Mm -hmm. I don't want to call it a crisis, because that makes it sound as though it's a passing thing. It's mm -hmm. a condition mm -hmm. now. And, uh, and, and in fact, I found a list last night of, of the sort of originating impulses, and one of them was refugees, because that, that carried through from the making of Giselle, where that was very much a part of the conversation. And, and then to be in Athens, you are always reminded of the fact that, that Greece is, is a, well, has been at the epicentre of so much of that human movement. And we talked a lot about and explored the idea of the trenches as a kind of hostile environment, but actually a, a hostile environment isn't just a place, it mm. can also be mm. a policy, mm. and it was Theresa May's policy as Home Secretary exactly. mm. to actually create a hostile mm. environment for migrants and refugees. And the piece is called Xenos, which means stranger, it also means guest, mm. and I think that those two meanings are really important mm. and, and played a big role in all of the conversations that we had about mm. the ways in which we, we hold others away from us, uh, but the, the Greeks are also have been hosting many tens of thousands of people and are asking many questions themselves about what it means to, uh, to sit, if you like, on the threshold between East and West, which is a place under so much pressure at the mm. moment. So mm. it was impossible not to think about those threshold experiences and experiences of, of human movement and loss. And that's why there are so few, if you like, sort of resources in the piece. We started to think mm -hmm. through the experience of people who travel only with what they have. And so we had a lot of materials that we played with in that Akram way. Mm -hmm. And you just think, this will go, this will go, this will be gone soon. And eventually, most of it was gone, apart from ropes and dirt mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, and clay, not a lot else. Um, and that came directly from thinking through and with really, those yeah. who have nothing. Mm. What else did you throw out? Clay? You throw out, there was a lot of clay at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, that's all. 
<laughs> Luckily. No, there were loads of stuff we threw out. I've got a list here. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> uh, a crowd. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. that's right. I wanted right. a lot of people on stage. Yeah, yeah, but then we were fighting that that's not a solo. Well, then. he's the only person I've ever known to make a solo which might inv also involve a crowd 40, of 30 40, or 40 yeah. people. Yeah. <laughs> For like three minutes, yeah. maybe. Yeah, so, Tra so they went. Travelling around the world. You were going to use your little one-wheeler, whatever that stupid thing is called. <laughs> <laughs> it's called that a one-wheel, actually. A gas yeah. mask. There gas was mask. a lot of gas, Michael. Yeah, we, gas mask. Gas uh, itself. Gas, gas mask for yep. dog. Yep. Some really that was, bad that was, boulders. That was the last thing, I think, that was let go yeah. of, yeah. was gas mask for dog. There was a dog. cube. There was a cube. That yeah. was a terrible idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a TARDIS, yeah. there were helmets. Yeah. Uh, the First World War kind yeah, of helmet. Books, yeah. spells. Uh, books we kept. And a puppet. You played around with the puppet yeah. for others. It yeah. was a huge list. We're one day we're going to make a musical that's going to involve. It's all going to be about artificial others. intelligence, of course. But it'll yeah. have all the objects that have never made <laughs> it into uh, it. Some lanterns. Uh, yeah, the lanterns. But that's my fault. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. And uh, so, can I? Can I just? Uh, so, uh, sorry, we're, we're we're still on this uh, this topic of um, uh, of what's happening, you know, in the world and. So, I mean, I, I suppose um, the question is whether um, the arts have a role in reflecting or trying to change what's going on in the world, reflect, it, try and make some impact. Do you think it has any impact? Do you think when people see this work, they feel differently about what... Uh, we, we're, we're doing a... We're doing a uh, Q&A at the end, so we can't, <laughs> uh, but we, we will open this up. Uh, let's keep it to the panel at the moment. Do you think we can really make a difference in that way? I think way? the question is also, do you want yeah. to make it uh, 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 impact in a way that uh, lasts outside the theatre? Mm -hmm. um, and an example that I kept referring to was uh, Romeo Castellucci's mm -hmm. work, theatre director, incredible theatre mm -hmm. director, that really had an impact on my thinking after I left the auditorium, and I think it had a huge impact on uh, all the audience, or most of the audience members. And I think that question kept coming up, how do we, how, how does it transcend, or how does it <coughs> shift from the, the, the theater into people's lives? Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, that was one of the first uh, initial uh, questions that I was asking, and that was a question that was shared with everybody yeah. in the as an as an intention. I think, I think, uh, as artists, you have a responsibility mm -hmm. to present uh, um, other narratives, uh, other images than the ones that are so prevalent, mm -hmm. and also with um, we haven't used the word nationalism mm -hmm. yet, but that's an ugly uh, kind of rising tide. And I think that that is part of the background mm. that we're operating in, whether that's to do with Brexit or um, whitewashing history or um, I think nationalism, um, everybody wants to claim the victory. Um, maybe that's because it then justifies the enormous uh, loss of life and the expense in you know, blood, sweat, tears, money, life um, and not allow other people uh, or not acknowledge other you know other contributors yeah. to that whether it's whether it's the first world war and it's um, let's forget the Americans came and helped out or uh, Anzacs I mean I think there probably is a kind of uh, hierarchy that starts with white at the top mm. and, and black at the bottom mm. that um, is kind of supported by that nationalism yeah. and wanting to claim the victory for our sort. Mm. Yeah. Maybe what do you think about this subject, about our impact on the world as an art form? Well, I think what is, uh, I'm going to bring it back again to the, this particular work, actually. What is interesting is whilst the intention was very clearly there as a framework from the beginning, it was never a driven force through the process, which I think is what is special and actually carried the message further. Mm -hmm. Because what 
the process was about, once the intention was clear, was about consistently, collectively working to find the purest, most honest moment through the piece for everything. Mm. Mm. And I think that honesty in, actu in mm. actuality um, allows for a stronger message to come out because it's poetic. Mm. So um, it's a very, again, it's a very specific way of working that is, that is not a kind of a frame about, okay, we're going to create this message and this has to be driven through to the audience. Yeah. It was about creating a poetic message about truth, really, mm. and honesty. Mm. Mm. It sounds to me, and um, you, you've all worked um, with other people as collaborators, um, that there's something special that happens with this man and the way that that, I mean, you know, not to put you on the, or to divulge on any, any other stories of collaboration, but <laughs> something particularly in the way this, the Akram's process, I mean, I'm saying Akram, but it's all your process, works in a particular way. Is that, would, would that be true that there's something, I mean, you obviously feel that, you know, because you work with him so yeah. many times, but yeah. uh, others, is it, is it something that's really unique? I think what he does is he he brings together a team of people, and it truly it is. It's very easy to use these words because people kind of say it all the time, but it's so tangible really when we are in that process. Is that the space is genuinely a sacred space of work, and I think for me, kind of as the rehearsal director, my job really is to first and foremost ensure that. I can kind of understand what the needs of all these artists are, need for the work, you know, so that I can ensure that the work stays in a particular place. But I don't think there's a sense of that Michael is the lighting mm. guy and that Ruth is the dramaturg and that Vince is the music guy. Mm. I think it's a collection of artists mm. that he brings together mm. and that res genuine respect for that artistic communi uh, communication to happen and uh, that everyone is really egoless. And yeah. that's very hard to find, uh, at least in my uh, experience, where there's a sense of letting go when it's not needed by each artist. Yeah. Uh, it's quite special. It's very special, actually. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's a, an account of the, the in, inward-looking side of the making. Uh, and from the outward-looking side, I think the thing that I feel so strongly about is that Akram is a, a consummate storyteller. He's, he, yeah. he loves story and he loves narrative and understands the human impulse, the universal mm. human impulse, which is why it so often begins with mythology, yeah. um, because it, it underpins so much of, or so many of the stories that we continue to tell. But I think that beyond that, he also has an incredible uh, respect for and trust in ambiguity. Mm. And, mm. and that, to me, speaks to all of us as audiences because it, it empowers us to complete these stories for ourselves rather than to sit there passively and receive something that's already completed. Yeah. And I'm absolutely loving watching the signers. I always love watching signers because for me, their storytelling is ambiguous, but it also has a great precision in it. And that's that combination, I think, of ambiguity and, and precision. That's where the human truth and the expanded sense of what it is to be human lies for me. Yeah. And I think the ambiguity takes you to a place of discomfort as well as yeah, an yeah. audience member, which, which is both empowering as, and at the same time it's profoundly disorientating, yeah. going back to yeah, that yeah. first word. And I think it reflects back on the experience of trying to figure it out in the moment, as often you are as artists working together. It's not, you know, that sense of, that sense of, Ambiguity completing the jigsaw is also the experience of often being the other and working your way through life trying to understand it. So that transcends really powerfully through the works is that this is not just something that you want to complete as an audience member, this is also how it feels to be me, how yeah. it feels to be these people in these yeah. stories. I, I have, got, I have a, uh, a, a black friend who describes it as uh, cultural proprioception, yeah. trying, literally right. trying yeah. to find your body in yeah. space as you move through yeah. somebody else's culture. And, yes. and I think that that's, Akram has experienced that and, and is communicating that experience in this piece yeah. as well. Um, what's really interesting for me um, as a uh, collaborating uh, with the team is um, uh, there is, a, from the outside, there is a sense of chaos. Mm. 
um, because there are no borders, but there is, but there at inside there is an understanding that we respect. I respect Michael in his craft. I respect Ruth, but we're constantly crossing mm. over. Mm. So you know uh, the latest things that's uh, that's uh, happened, and I don't know if it's a good thing. Um, is that Michael texts me at two or three o'clock in the morning <laughs> with notes, um, which are very little to do with lights. Yeah. <laughs> so I you wake mean, up. You mean after each show when he's seen the show yeah, yeah. on the road? It's yeah, still yeah, going yeah. on. It's still going on. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. I have some notes for. Yeah. Well, he show. says that your last spin there wasn't could really have been, up to scratch. It could be, it could be. <laughs> <laughs> or your focus, you know, was, you know, but in, 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 even too much on the shirt buttons. <laughs> but even though I'm joking, um, it, it sh what's beautiful about that is that um, there is a 100% immersion yes. of all the collaborators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to watch Vincent, uh, Vince work on the project um, all throughout the creation, even after the premiere, he was constantly calling Maven and the sound people to check. He, it's his baby as much as it yeah, is sure. mine or anybody yeah. else's. Yeah. So there is a real immersion, 100% yeah. immersion of all the artists. Yeah. And actually, it's this immersion that is so specific um, because I, you know when I'm when I'm coaching his work, it's very interesting because it's not um, the steps is one thing, and then there's a whole other spirit mm. that is you can feel in the theatre. And, and and when I'm coaching it, it's so important for me to get this out, not just from him, but from the dancers as well. I remember so clearly uh, with Giselle, yeah. there's a scene where you know the the, the women come out for the first mm. time, the villies, mm. yeah. and the simplicity of the action that they're doing, they're just doing bourrees with sticks. Yeah. But every time you're in the audience and you feel the audience resonate with an experience, and it's because that one action of them coming out has with it his whole life and his whole history of culture and, and, and female uh, womanhood and life and death, and not just his, but Vince's and Ruth's, and it's all immersed in this kind of space as they come out, yeah. um, and it's 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 one of the things that for me is so important to sustain and maintain whenever I'm working on his works. It's very specific. I think it also speaks back to your classical training, Akram, because within the Indian arts there isn't the segregation between music and dance and text and light. I mean, it is an art. Yeah. It's a holistic art form, mm -hmm. and I think what you're hearing here and what and what is obviously evident is that that immersive, holistic relationship to art where it spills over and there aren't these hierarchies and demarcations and barriers. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's it seems to me, it comes sorry. back to the other and sometimes the other can see something or hear something mm -hmm. that you just can't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I think that all the collaborators are, uh, for me, I think it's, we're all involved in making a piece of theatre. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's dance, yes, but we're all involved in making a piece of theatre and we bring particular kind of skills to that mm -hmm. and sort of specialisms. But you shouldn't be involved in this process if you can't um, take someone else mm -hmm. yeah. saying to you, what about that? Yes, Why don't yeah, you could yeah. try that? Or yeah. that doesn't, you know, or... And so I think that there's a kind of exchange between, yeah. you know, everyone yeah. that... Um, could be a positive, it could be kind of um, no, it could be yes, or you know, that, that, that you've missed something. And you go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's. Mm. But the important thing is to have the space to do that. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and allow. And, and the trust. And that is interesting from a Zeno's perspective, because as a dancer, uh, I can say that actually often, I always say this, the amount of times I felt such a foreigner. Mm working be purely because of the way I want to immerse myself in the work. And it's almost seen, that, seen as slightly being uncool within this sector, which is looking at professionalism in a very specific way. Yeah. And yeah. so then to be able to be given a space to work where I can totally immerse and all those values of submission and surrender as an artist are embraced as yeah. opposed to mm. kind of gone, going, oh, this is too much, yeah. is quite yeah. magical. So um, I'm glad you brought up the other, Michael, because <laughs> we're about to go into the last section now, um, otherness. Um, and so again, we're going to have a little film to precede this.
senos, stranger, unknown, foreign, other. What does it mean for someone of Akram status to entitle the final performance solo of his extraordinary performance career, Zenos? Why is it vital for us to reconsider our relationship to the other in this specific socio-political moment amidst rising tides of xenophobia, a fear of the other? How can the other disrupt the center from firmly within it? What can we learn about ourselves from the other? How can the other write themselves into the landscape of British dance so as to fundamentally transform how it looks, who it speaks to, and what it speaks of? From start to finish, Zenos generates a sense of disease. The melodious tarana distorts in and out of grating, disorientating industrial drones. The poignant Hindu and Urdu lyrics remain untranslated. A layer of meaning unapologetically hidden <coughs> from many in the audience. Our access to the, to the layers of the performance teeters between the familiar and the unknown, just as Akram teeters on the edge of the trenches trying to make sense of his life as a colonial soldier. Our stomachs churn as his body is hurled across the earth. We hold on to the hope offered in the one pine cone that he buries, until even that is obliterated by the avalanche of pine cones that nearly then bury him. Nothing makes sense. Yet, through the strange, we cobble together a deep and empathetic understanding of the other. As one that is permanently under scrutiny and on edge, we experience what it is like to not understand, and most importantly, to be not understood. So this uh, subject <coughs> of, um, of being the other, of being outside of the norm, on the edges, uh, foreign, <laughs> is something that's been a theme right through all of your work, um, I think. And, um, and obviously that's come from a very personal place and experience. Um, so how other do you feel, Akram? <laughs> now? I mean... Or, or have you been? I think it's changed over time. I think um, as a uh, uh, as a Kathak dance, it depends on which uh, which where you place where I'm placed, where I am at the moment. Um, when I'm in a school ground in Wimbledon, I'm uh, brown. Um, when I'm amongst Kathak dancers, I'm Bangladeshi, not Indian. When I'm, uh, uh, yeah, so, so uh, the only place I, I don't feel the other is um, uh, actually when I'm with artists. Mm. Somehow mm. it's the least I feel the other. I definitely felt being the other um, uh, with Brexit, for sure. M half my team, and, you know, that the, the, we're all from so many different places, mm. Mm. origins, and uh, I, uh, uh, but yeah. Um, uh, I felt other very much in my community as the one who didn't go to private school mm -hmm. because the majority of kids went to private, uh, my generation went to private school. So it just depends where you place me, but I felt other, I, I'm sure many people feel being the other. Yes, I mean it is an interesting question, what are we the other, what is the other side of the other? <laughs> what, are, what do we mean by not being at the centre of things is a, is a question, I suppose. But, uh, Royana, what do you think? Who, what is, how would you describe the opposite of the other? So, really, we're talking about Eurocentric view of the world, for, for instance. Any yeah, other? I mean, in this, in this particular context, perhaps a, um, an art scene or a, or a dance landscape, say, for example, that is predominantly defined by Eurocentric values, Eurocentric ways of understanding what the body should look like, how it should perform, the languages are that it has to um, become you know, ve fairly versatile and flexible across. 
So, so in that centre, um, we have had Akram's body of work that's been silently and consistently chipping away at changing what that landscape looks like who it speaks to, what stories it speaks of. Um, and yeah, that's a, and I talk about that in the book, in my book, it's like it's the only book, no, it's, it's, it's the, the, I talk about it in the book, very much um, focusing on how the power of change from being within the center has ripple impacts which are um, profound. I think, Maven, you can talk a little bit about the, the choices that you and Accra made around, or, and Vince too, around the music and the, mm. uh, and the, the, pre, the preset musical mm. sequence, which is followed by the classical. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, it's one of the most strongest, without any inten intended uh, intention to be, it's one of the most strongest political <laughs> moments of the show actually yeah. because as an Indian artist one of the first things that you're well, not one of the first things but you are always kind of uh, at the back of your mind pressured about how accessible can your art be for non-Indian audiences exactly. you know and it's like oh, oh you know how can I make the piece shorter there do I need to have translation for it because they don't understand and I, I remember in Greece actually when Akram decided with great clarity that we're going to have this preset of um, the two Indian musicians with a very classical concert. And they were like, in the dress rehearsal, there were about 700 Greek dance students uh, coming to watch. And I just sat at the theater and I thought, my God, these kids would never, ever, mm. ever <laughs> have even gone on, on YouTube to listen to mm -hmm. something exactly. like this, let alone to a live show. Yeah. And they are here and they are being made to watch it yes. and listen. <laughs> and for me, and then of course you see it in the, each theater and there was this real sense of almost kind of like a, a kind of a, a, a political rebellion against any imperialist uh, connotation that we've had in terms of you are now going to sit and you're going to listen to this. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, which is yes. amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. interesting. Yeah. When, when we were discussing that right at the beginning of the process, I think, I remember w you told me it's my last piece and I want to have an element of Indian classical work, but I don't know why, how. There was a bit of uh, uncertainty about how to introduce that and how to make it fit within a theatrical um, structure. And yeah, I remember talking and then just deciding, you know what, we're gonna go fully, like fully, like let's give it a big, big space that it's clearly, um, yeah, the, clearly classical, like yeah. going into something. And for me, actually, it's not really a world that I belong to. I, and you know, we also had this conversation that I told you, like, are you sure you want me to do this? Because I have a bit of a um, love-hate relationship with the, with, with the, with the style. And um, <laughs> the answer was, yes, that's exactly why. Yeah. <laughs> And, and how, how, how then we transform that into, into the rest of the, of the journey. Yeah. And Akram had a good um, reflection of yesterday's performance when you were saying how the Indian audience were guiding. Guiding the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the white audience. Yeah. yeah. What they were telling you. The, re the response at the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, it just took a few Indians. <laughs> <laughs> and literally, um, they, they were educating. What, during the show? No, the preset. Oh, the, preset. Oh. the preset reveals so much of, uh, who's, in the of who's in the house and, how, how, and the culture difference. Um, and it was just really interesting because yesterday they went silent yeah. because there was a presence of the Indian audience listening. kind of listening. Yeah. Yeah. And so they thought, yeah. well, maybe we have to listen. And then when he finished singing, they would all clap. Yeah. Uh, and then suddenly, every, and they, then they knew the ritual. Yeah. 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 And that was really interesting, yeah. yeah. But that almost takes me back to the way in which I remember when I first encountered your work in Polaroid Feet all those years ago in South Bank, there was that similar moment of what's the balance between making something accessible and I hate that word, actually, because I, we're not here to make something easy for you. This is a difficult experience. This yeah. is a complex 
life condition, I'm not going to make it easy for you. But at the same time, I'm going to allow enough port portals. And if you want, mm. you can then enter that portal to try mm. and find out more about this experience. So that, to me, is exactly what your work does, is it just mm. lends these ways in if you want it. Mm. And yeah. it's this thing of, uh, 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 in, a nice, in a nice way, my father and my mother, what's really interesting is that um, there's a real difference in what they expect. There's the entitlement that my father has that um, you know, says, well, um, uh, Akram, I, did, I didn't understand the show. You know, that scene I didn't understand. Why were you not clear about it? And, and, um, and then I would explain what, it, uh, what my version, <laughs> what my version is, and he, he, he would say, oh, so you should make that clearer. Um, and then there's my mother, who, who doesn't think in an entitled way that you know, we should know the story, mm -hmm. where she has a huge sense of curiosity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to imagine what her version of it was. Yeah. And so it's, in, in, in my parents, there's complete duality, mm -hmm. different uh, ways of approaching the work. Yeah. And there is, for, for all of us, I think, that it was very important to be um, accessible in a, in a universal sense. Mm -hmm. But I think it's about uh, what Ruth always tries to do is to, which I saw, uh, which I experienced with Peter Brook, is to uh, um, cut away everything until you get to the essence of what you want to say. And Vince and I spoke a lot about it, Michael and I, uh, Maven, all, all the, Mirella, yeah. Jordan, Tannehill, especially, we, we all spoke about what is the crux of this mm. narrative. Yeah. Mm. And then, but accessible or universal doesn't, uh, you know, I came, that's why we were talking earlier about Larbi and I with Zero Degrees. Um, there was these comments from the high art society that Zero Degrees was accessible, which meant, but they were looking down at it yeah. when they were saying it mm. to both Larbi and I. Mm. And Larbi was amazing, but we were in Belgium and it was a, uh, it was quite, it was a very established, mm -hmm. famous choreographer who was, speaking at us like, well, it was very easy work. Yeah. And Larbi came back in a very strong way because I was a bit in shock. So Larbi did the speaking in, in Flemish. And it was fascinating because um, what we both realized was that w we kind of uh, noticed that there's high art uh, and there's a club and then anything that is accessible like Michael Jackson or Charlie Chaplin or Bruce Lee, um, was not appreciated because it was it was a number game. There were too many people. So what we realized, both Larbi and I discussed in Zero Degrees that actually we were hugely influenced by Michael Jackson mm -hmm. and hugely influenced by Charlie Chaplin. Um, but just because millions of people love it and, and feel connected to it doesn't mean there is not craft and rigor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so you know, somehow Larbi and I, this generation, started to feel very connected to yeah. popular mm. uh, 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 music and, and movement and mm. other art forms. Um, because there is only, for what we felt was there was only good, good art and bad art. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it was not about whether it falls under pop. Because under pop, uh, for me, Sia, for example, is amazing. Mm. Uh, under the music videos, which <laughs> is commercial, let's say, um, this is America no. is incredible, which you introduced me to. Um, powerful in its statement, political, yeah. huge amounts of craft. Yeah. Yeah. And art. Incredible. And art. Yeah. 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 And yet millions of people have seen it. Yeah. Yeah. So this, I would say this generation doesn't have um, a, a trauma about it being mm. many people seeing it and being feeling like, well, actually, um, it doesn't mean that art is less just because yeah, um, yeah. A taxi driver can understand it, or, yeah. a, or, or, or a restaurant owner can understand it, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just to get back to otherness uh, for a minute, which is the subject of this bit. <laughs> uh, isn't it true to say, I mean, I've observed um, that a, a, lot, a lot of art is created by people who are the other, in one way or another. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's because uh, of a feeling of isolation or, or not being at the centre of things that actually drives people to make art. Mm. Don't you think? I mean, actually, even in the generation you're talking about with Larby, and it's the subject at the moment, isn't it? Displacement, identity, yeah. 
you know, what is, what is it to be in this society where we're kind of, you know, faced with all of these different stories and, uh, and experiences all the time. It's, it's, it is our subject, isn't it? I, th I mean, I, in my experience, it's, it's an absolutely quintessential contemporary issue. Mm -hmm. But I think something that I've learned a little bit through this process is that othering, the act of othering, is, is different from the experience of estrangement because I think we're all estranged from, from many aspects of our own lives mm. at the moment. We're certainly estranged from our, from our politics um, and our sense of how to be agents within that. We're, we're estranged from our own bodies through technology and, and I think that that's a very significant thing. But, but I think that othering is, involves a power relationship yes. and it yeah. certainly involves Absolutely. some kind of uh, degradation of others. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it, you know, it is an active thing, and it, and it does come from from a, a, a white colonial centre, oh, and it is so. still in our bodies and in our mm. languages. Mm. And and one of the things that I felt really strongly about Zenos is that uh, it goes back to a Michael Frayn quote that I'm, I've sort of carried around with me for years. That he says, um, "We are each at the centre of our own universe, but at the same time, we're peripheral participants in immense patterns." Yeah. And I, I feel as though Xenos shifts that centre to a place where many of us have not been before, but it at the same time acknowledges us that we are all part of immense patterns that sweep us mm. through history uh, against our wills in many ways. And mm. Mm. it's that movement between, you know, my centre is, is someone else's edge and my yeah. edge is someone else's centre. I think it just expands mm. your... Your, your, uh, your, the aperture with which you look at the mm. world, and that's what's been really profound for mm. me. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I think it might be time to open this up yeah, to the rest of the audience, and what would be very helpful is if we could see the audience, because I can't <laughs> even see, that's better, yeah. if anyone has their hands up. Um, so, yes, and I think what's going to happen, because we're Facebook living this, um, the questions will need to be um, through a microphone. So who would like to go first on this? Yeah. Can I just say, I don't know why you two are here. <laughs> oh. Musicians. Ah. This is your day off. <laughs> you should have been... <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, I had to point out it is Akram's day off from performing. Because <laughs> he doesn't do it. I, had, I didn't force him to do every night on stage. <laughs> yes, right at the back. Hello. Um, oh, this yeah. is a question posted on the Sad as Well's Facebook page. Oh, yeah, so sorry, we have questions on Facebook as well. That's how up to date we are. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is Akram, why a solo and not an ensemble piece? For 1.4. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I uh, I knew when I was creating, w working with the team to create Giselle, um, that I got very excited um, uh, by exploring ideas through other people's, other dancers' bodies, and I was getting less and less excited through my own body. Um, and so I knew it was it was time mm. uh, uh, to uh, uh, kind of um, uh, release the body of um, dancing full length solos. Um, so I wanted to at least finish with one more um, to close it somehow, uh, because everything is ritualistic really in, in in our lives. So I wanted to treat it like a ritual of of of. Um, Completing it, but funnily enough, um, I'm in discussions about uh, Zenos um, being um, uh, uh, a group piece now, um, w with 14 male dancers wow. and maybe uh, a few female dancers. We're not sure yet. We're still in very early discussion, but a big group piece um, because I'm also very stubborn. So when my team said. Um, no, you can't have, uh, it doesn't make sense to have the 40 community <laughs> <laughs> performers. I'm thinking, okay, so how do I get around this? And, uh, <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, I, I, I knew that it was time. I, I felt ready to, uh, 
um, slowly retire from full length solo. And also, it's, it's a lot to do with family. Um, I was missing my children on tour, and um, I, you know, I didn't want to keep performing. Um, and my children are so manipulative in a very interesting way because <laughs> we built a studio at the back garden, so which has windows, so every time I'm rehearsing, they come with this kind of... <laughs> um, my son particularly, he's three, and he just comes with this puppy face, um, like he's an orphan. <laughs> um, like I'm doing something very evil by ignoring him. And so this happens on a daily basis. So that was another reason I thought I should kind of, yeah. <laughs> We're not sure if we feel the same about uh, our feeling about you or losing uh, interest in you as a performer. You may be thinking that no, yourself, but I, we are, we're definitely not. <laughs> as a performer, I'm really interested, but as a, as a dancer, uh, I, I feel... Um, uh, I, because my body speaks many things of... Um, of what I wanted to speak, it doesn't speak, it speaks more of pain, and it complains a lot, it nags a lot. <laughs> Um, and uh, you just like stop it, you know, this is enough, stop um, complaining. So I, I just, um, I think that's the bit I, I got to, I talked to a few friends who are in their 40s and um, funnily enough, 43 is an interesting age because it's happening to them as well where they kind of felt uh, that the body's speaking so much about, you know, this is complaining and that's complaining and mm -hmm. I was just a bit tired of that. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I think we have one, yeah? Thank you for your oddness. <laughs> I feel better. Uh, and a question, my question is, we started, you started with a simple story from the history, from the Indian history. Do you have, during the time when you perform this piece and when you travel with these uh, with, with ideas around the world, any, like a particular concrete um, example of the other stories? Do, do people come back and tell you the stories about themselves? Mm. It's provoking them mm. to do this? I think I, uh, I've had um, several uh, uh, moments um, in Australia, in Greece for sure, mm. a lot. Um, uh, it was really interesting because there was a little girl who saw the show in Greece, and it was, I think, um, one of the CEOs of that, um, that theatre, that building, Onassis Centre, and um, it was her, she, she had uh, two daughters, I think, and one of the daughters was very small and the other one was, but they both were at the show, and um, uh, 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 she, she, uh, she came to see the show and then was sent home straight after the show because it was quite late, and I think she was, um, uh, the the child minder or, or, or the nanny was explaining in the car to her um, that uh, this show is too adult for you. Um, you should not have been seeing this show. <laughs> and the the youngest one, I think, said uh, started to cry and said, "No, you don't understand. I understood the piece. I connected with the piece. Um, the pine cones." which we still um, are questioning uh, uh, what it concretely means to us. We're still investing, we just believe in it. Mm -hmm. But the little girl said um, that it's the souls yeah. of, of the, 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 the Zenos, uh, the foreigners who, who um, haven't been buried oh, properly. Wow. Because I constantly was making yeah. mounds of earth yeah. right from the beginning mm -hmm. till the end. And in the end, I put the pine cone, and she said he, put, he found the pine cone, the soul, mm. to be buried in the earth so it can grow again. Yeah. Mm. So there's hope. Exactly. Mm. And that came from a little girl. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, I, I, and we went, uh, that's exactly what we were thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and that became a very significant part of the narrative. <laughs> but it's, 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 it's amazing how different people yeah, come in different countries to, to, and respond to the work and how they feel. Because I think Xenos is not, yeah, I hope that it's, we hope that it's not just, it's, a, it's about, we are all strangers, like Ruth was saying. We're all strangers uh, from 
politics to from something, yeah. to something. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's a u universal epidemic. There's someone in the middle there. Can, you get Can someone get that person a mic? Oh, yeah. Thank you for not blaming the Greeks for once, being born in Athens a long, long time ago. So it's good to hear very good things about Athens. Have you had your title before you start the piece, or did you put the title on at the end? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 it was always there when... It used to be Xenos um, uh, disarming the gods, yes. which sounded really pretentious, so I'm glad we lost that too. Yeah. <laughs> but the, but it, it was Xenos right from the beginning, wasn't yeah. it? But I don't know where that came from. That you, you I, I think I, I, I go through... I have a collection of titles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that sometimes I like a word and I love the meaning of it. So I still have like uh, 30 or 40 uh, titles. And uh, when, I was, when we were talking about Prometheus, that was, um, Xenos was the first uh, one that uh, connected and with we it. actually say Xenos. Xenos, yeah. Xenos. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Getting by. Yeah, a bit sharper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also, sometimes on the other side, being outside, don't you feel one can look in and find things about places, about people, that once you're in it, you can't really see, so therefore you mm. make more interesting work. Well, that relates really to your yeah. question, doesn't it? That to be in the mainstream is but to potentially to shift the centre and, not, and to yeah, see exactly. everything else as the margins again. And, we, and I think we are all perpetually at risk of that. Um, I mean, I, I, obviously I'm not answering for Akram, but from my experience with the company, yes, it is a very privileged company it's well resourced compared with so many other companies. But, but one thing that I really feel strongly is that as, as a result of that and in awareness of that, I think that Akram in particular and everyone within that company tries to throw the net of opportunity as widely as possible. And I, I mean, it is really true that, that Akram at so many levels and most of them invisible to us, is involved in mentoring young artists and young people all the time. And, and he didn't say that. He could have said in response to your question that, that that is in a sense, and it doesn't happen out of guilt, it happens out of a sense of what do we do with the resource to make this, this to amplify the possibilities that we're all involved in. And I, and I genuinely believe that that happens in acknowledgement of the fact that it comes from a privileged place where there's the potential to do it. Yeah. It's a complicated thing, this relationship between the centre and the edge. It really, really is. It could, it, it could be quite easy to become complicit in the privilege and not necessarily still remain that, uh, retain that sense of critique and distance. But I think, you, you, yeah, there's a, there's a fine balance there that's tread, yeah. as you've explained. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, right at the back. I wonder if you could just pass your mic, that's great. A tongue-in-cheek question that begs to be asked, does that mean there are 30 or 40 potential plays, pieces, to yet <laughs> come? At least. At least. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rita, I'm from Portugal, and uh, I would like to ask, beyond all the subjects that we have been talking that are very connected with this piece, Zenos, I would like to know uh, which are the, the, the message of hope that you want to address with this piece, Zenos. Thank you. Does somebody else want to respond? <laughs> <coughs> Maven? Uh, Michael? Oh. <laughs> There's one thing I, I feel, and I yeah. can only talk about what I feel when I see it, that in that final image when the pine cones are falling, Akram is, is moving towards them yeah. and into them. And this was something that Michael, in his dramaturgical intervention, reminded <laughs> us of <laughs> very recently, in fact, after the opening night, that, that originally we, Akram had explored literally moving against the tide of the yeah. pine cones. And, it's a, such a little thing, but it's such a big thing in so many ways as well. And I think the fact that he climbs, he chooses to climb, 
and it's on the one hand, it's an act of surrender. There's no triumph and there's no heroism in it. But in, on the other hand, it's an act of care, mm -hmm. I think, that taking that final pine yeah. cone. Mm -hmm. And I remember when we started these conversations that one of the things, Akram, you said was that this, uh, this is a piece about my fear for my children, um, that they too will be washed away, swept away in, in the, this deranged tide that we let loose upon ourselves. And, and it, has, it feels to me that the hope lies in, in standing in resistance to that flow, and if that means resistance to social media and to you know to some of the things that we are all in danger of being swept away by, then mm -hmm. it feels valid and it feels valuable. But also in resistance to the myths that that would carry mm -hmm. us away to create our own myths in response to the situation that we find ourselves in, to find ways to expand our sense of what it is to be human. That's what that's what to me what all art really does at its best. And a resistance to stillness. I yeah. think hope <coughs> lies in movement. That we can't, I'm not saying physical movement, but we have to constantly keep moving. Mm. I think we have another question on <laughs> Facebook, yeah. Thank you. Uh, this question uh, comes from the Akron Khan Company Facebook page. Um, Alina asks, you've mentioned that when you hear music, you see movement. I was amazed by the way you all, i.e. the creative team, visualize exactly what you have in mind in a way that the audience understands it. So does it start with the music? Hmm. Ta-da! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Well, no, you. I, I'll take it after you. No, no, you first. <laughs> no, no, you first, come on. Um, I think movement uh, is the first trigger. But movement, um, this, is, this is me trying to be clever, movement uh, in, is the beginning of everything, actually, of music. Mm -hmm. For music to happen, there has to be vibration. Mm -hmm. So it could take place in form of music sometimes, and sometimes it, it starts with music, but that's still back to movement. Or it could start with an image which provokes me or us, and that's also a movement. So it, it's, it's, it's about vibration, really. So it could, take, it could start from movement or music or a word. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a very organic process. To go back to what we were discussing at the very beginning of this talk, it's... This group work, works like, a, like one body. It needs to become one element. And I believe we, we just um, create the, the space and the energy for us to find, um, to, to let the peace come out on its own. It's just like we, we allow that to happen. So in a way, um, music, movement, ideas, they all come together and, and I mean, practically, we sit down and talk a lot. There's a, there's a good six months of talk and conversations, which obviously spark all the idea, the practical ideas. But um, as philosophical as it can sound, but it's really an organic process of uh, a whole body that moves together towards one goal, which is um, let the art come out. That's, that's how I see it. And it's funny because you don't, I don't really know. That's why I was looking at Ruth. Like, the title, it becomes unimportant who originates the mm -hmm. idea in the group. I mean, sometimes one movement idea might come from Michael or Maven might suggest something with the sound or Ruth might suggest something with the lights that triggers Michael to then do something or for me to do something mm -hmm. in our own field. So yeah. it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's um, a collective kind of, yeah. yeah, I don't know where it comes from. Manju really. said to me the other day, there's six performers but one voice. And I think that's the outcome. Yeah. And, yeah. and actually, there's a, there are pulses that run through the drumming, through, through the score, but then they also run into Akram's body and likewise the other way. So the thrashing of the rope sends a pulse along the rope 
that enters into the, the movement as well as the music. And I think that the, it's true that they are about vibration and pulse and, and it flows from one to the other. It, it should. Mm. And it's just... Um, Mirella, who uh, designed the, the set, set, the sonographer, isn't here. But um, so I'm just imagining that for her, she has to come up with something quite early on mm. relative to where we're at. I, mm. I could go and change the lights now. Mm. Vince could change a bit of music. Yeah. We could change a little, we mm. could change things now. But Fish. that set's quite monolithic. Mm. So in terms, that's a big uh, part of the starting point yeah. for yeah. me yeah. because the first things that I know are the themes that we're going to start with the classical and that's the set's going to look like that. Yeah. That's that's kind of, yeah. That's even uh, for me before music. Um, but the set, because it's big, it's got to be designed, mm. costed, find someone to build it, yeah. all of that. Yeah. It's, it's because it's so concrete yeah. compared to uh, everything else. Yeah. That's, that's a kind of uh, big starting point. The place we're going to live in. The place, yeah. this is it, that we, this is physically the world and can, what can be done with that slope? Is yeah. it too yeah, steep? Is it not steep enough? Bit. What's behind yeah. it? And so that's a, uh, so I'm sure um, Mirella might feel that she's kind of very much in the, the person who's got the blank canvas yeah. uh, yeah. and that other things are going to develop, mm -hmm. but that yeah. early on she's got to, yeah. you know, come up. But something that we kind of all go, yeah. Okay, I th I'm afraid we have to stop because this is a Facebook Live thing. So uh, we have run out of time. And, um, but I want to thank you for coming. Uh, this was fascinating. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you very much uh, to Rona for the um, provocations. And thank you for the, to the, to the collaborators for being here. And thank you for the signers. Yeah. Thank you very much.
सबके पाला